Mount Everest, the world's highest mountain. Every year, hundreds of climbers, both professional and amateur, successfully reach the top. At any one time in the climbing season, there are over 1,000 people making the attempt. Behind virtually every endeavor lies the support and expertise of the Sherpas, the unsung heroes of the mountain. They guide, carry the equipment, prepare the routes, and rescue climbers who get into difficulty. Every day, risking their own lives so that others can claim the glory. Without them, only the hardiest and most skilled mountaineers would succeed. This is their story. Kathmandu, Nepal. Its chaotic streets couldn't be more different to the tranquil Sherpa villages high in the mountains. It is the home of Nima, who hopes to give his children a better future in this overcrowded city. Purba comes from a remote forest village in the Makalu region. Lukla, the hub of Himalayan tourism, is the home of Nima Tenji. Gelu Sherpa is less typical. He spends the peak climbing season in the Himalayas, but seeks work in Austria and Germany during the summer and winter months. It's spring, 2011. The four Sherpas have been hired by Theo Fritscher, an extreme climber from Austria, and Jochen Hemleib, an alpine historian from Germany, to take part in an international expedition up Everest. To prepare for the ascent of Everest, the team sets out through the villages of Nepal's Solokumbu district. Everything must be carried on foot. Paba, Nima Tenji, Nima and Gelu are not the only Nepalese who are needed. A whole team of guides and porters over a dozen strong, carry the heavy equipment required for the expedition's ascent of Everest. And it's been this way since the very first attempts to climb the mountain. In 1922, the first ever expedition to make a full-scale attempt to climb Everest was made by the British, among them George Mallory. Of the 160 men who made up the team, only 13 were British. Mallory was caught in an avalanche on the North Col. Seven of his Sherpas were killed, the first ever recorded deaths on Mount Everest. Two years later, the team tried again. This time, with Mallory was Oxford student Andrew Irvine. On June the 6th, Mallory and Irvine set off with five Sherpas. The Sherpas all returned safely, but Mallory and Irvine vanished. Whether they reached the top 29 years before Hillary and Norgay has been the subject of heated debate ever since. To try and establish the pair's fate, 
In 1999, an international expedition set out to locate their bodies. Among them was Jochen Hemleib. On the very first day, a mummified body was found on a steep slope. It had to be Irvine or Mallory. A clothes tag brought certainty. Here, wait, this is George Mallory. Really? George Mallory. Oh my God. See that? George Mallory. Oh my God. The search continued, but the team were unable to locate Irvine's body. In 2010, another expedition launched the search for Andrew Irvine. It was led by Theo Fritscher, a highly experienced mountaineer who has climbed five of the 14 8,000 meter peaks, and once again, Alpine historian Jochen Hemleib. Many believe that Mallory and Irvine were unable to overcome the most difficult part of their route, the so-called second step, a 40-meter face at 8,600 meters. However, our expedition member, Thea Fritscher, climbed that passage solo, without rope in 2001. He thinks that this must have also been possible for Mallory and Irvine. Dass Mallory und Irvine das auch geschafft haben können. Fritscher wanted to establish whether Mallory and Irvine could have reached the summit with only the equipment that was available at the time. In 2001, I approached Everest in simple clothing, with just an emergency down jacket in my pack and no additional oxygen. I wanted to climb the mountain with fair means. From what I know today, Mallory or Irvine, at least one of them, may have been on the summit. The 2010 expedition failed due to bad weather. Now, just one year later, Theo Fritscher and Jochen Hemleib are taking another shot. And it is for this reason that they have hired Perba, Nima Tenji, Nima and Gelu. The four Sherpas will search for Irvine's body near Everest's peak. The history of the Sherpa people on the south side of the Himalayas goes back some 500 years. The literal meaning of Sherpa is the people from the east. A nomadic people, four different groups migrated from the highlands of Tibet into today's Nepal, where they settled at the foot of these seven and eight thousand meter mountains. The precise reason for the Sherpa's migration is unclear, but according to oral tradition, they set out in search of the mythical Shangri-La. The vast majority of the Sherpas practice Tibetan Buddhism. To reach enlightenment, some choose to become monks and enter monasteries, where they take vows to refrain from worldly pleasures. Twice a day, the conch horn calls the monks of Nepal's famous Tangboka monastery to puja, an act of devotion in which offerings are made to Buddha and religious texts chanted. Young boys enter the monastic community at the age of five or six. They will live a life of abstinence and austerity and spend many hours in meditation. Eventually, these novices hope for spiritual illumination, or nirvana. The Sherpa word for Everest is Komalungma, goddess mother of the world. So many choose to live high in the mountains above 3,000 meters, as close to the seat of the gods as possible. And for them, hard work in the fields 
is their perpetual high-altitude training. Sherpas breathe more efficiently at high altitude. Their pulmonary blood pressure rises less than that of other climbers. Scientific studies have found that Sherpas have at least 10 genes specifically adapted to high altitude living. <laughs> at 4,000 meters, the reduced air pressure provides 40% less oxygen than at sea level. This can lead to an accumulation of fluid in the lungs, which results in high altitude sickness and death. But the Sherpa's genetic structure reduces these effects at high altitudes. This makes them invaluable for any attempt on Everest. Nevertheless, the Sherpas, along with the rest of the team, must spend several weeks acclimatizing themselves. So they set off on a trek for Island Peak, a gentler climb much favored by less experienced mountaineers. At nearly 6,200 meters, it is the perfect preparation for the climb up Everest. Perba's nickname among his peers is Turbo. He's always among the first on the mountain and has an impressive record. I've reached the summit of Everest three times, as well as from five or six more ascents. I've also stood on Annapurna four times, on the Barunsa, the Makalu, and on many peaks along the Indian and Pakistani border, and on Manaslu. A few days later, and the acclimatization is almost complete. Wow! Yeah, baby! Yeah! As they reach Renjo Pass at 5,300 meters, they get their first glimpse of Mount Everest itself. Now the Sherpas will come into their own. One aspect is the Sherpa's sheer hardiness. We have already seen what great achievers they are, how able they are to push to great heights in a short time. We Westerners require much longer recovery periods. The Sherpas are pre-adapted for our mission because they have the ability to exploit brief windows of fair weather. On every journey into the mountains, the Sherpas tie prayer flags along the route. The flags are to seek divine blessing, spread compassion, and bring good luck to the expedition. Tenzing Norgay compared Everest to a mother hen. For Sherpas, climbing Everest has nothing to do with personal glory. It's more an expression of their religious beliefs. To reach the summit of the mountain is merely a way to draw closer to the five Buddhas represented by the prayer flags. In Buddhism, the path to enlightenment requires complete compassion and selflessness. For a Sherpa, this translates to guiding others safely up the mountain and back again, regardless of the danger to themselves. Of the more than 200 people who have died climbing Everest, a third have been Sherpas. The main Everest climbing season lasts for just a few weeks in the spring, just before the monsoon season. From June to August, daily rain turns the hills lush and green, but makes climbing impossible. So for much of the year, Sherpas live a relatively normal life. For some, this is a life that has remained unchanged for generations. As the spring season ends, Perba goes home together with his friend Uberatz, anxious to see his family before his next job begins. 
Both men have families in a tiny village in the Makalu region, a conservation area to the east of Mount Everest. But getting there is a four-day walk, and it's only for the first few kilometers that the pair can hope to hitch a ride. Abruptly, the more comfortable leg of Pada and Ubaratsi's journey comes to an end. Now they must continue their journey on foot. Uberats is growing weary after the long walk, so Perba stops at a farmhouse on the edge of the road to buy refreshments, a cucumber. Refreshed, they can continue their journey homeward. Hour after hour, Perba and Uberats continue their journey up the foothills of the mountain. It's Saturday, market day in Canterbury. Once a week, local farmers and travelling merchants come here to sell their goods. Rice flakes, various types of vegetable and potatoes are all on offer. Even piglets in handy baskets. Herber is looking for a gift for his little boy. It's the last big market on his way home, but it's still two days from his village. That evening, the two men head off to a local bar. The hostelry serves Tongba, a local beer. It's made by fermenting millet, which is left to stand for six months. Boiling water is added, and the mixture drunk through a straw until all the alcohol has gone. Next morning, they continue. Higher up now, the land changes. The soil is too poor for rice, so the farmers grow corn and sorghum, a type of grass grown for its edible grain. Sorghum is one of the staple sources of nutrition and is used to make bread. But it has another use. From it they brew the tongba that Perber so enjoyed the night before. It's the monsoon season. Almost every day, the sky darkens around noon. If it doesn't rain, it gets foggy. Mothers take advantage of the shade. In the summer, temperatures can reach 30 degrees. So as the sun goes in, they bring out their babies. By now, Perba and Uberats are only a day's walk away from home. In the heavy rain, they meet men from their village. Oh, 
The villagers bring bad news. The heavy rains on the mountains have caused the river, which Purba and Uberats must cross to get home, to flood. It's now impassable. But Purba cannot wait. His next job will not allow for it. Now he won't be able to see his wife and children for another three to four months. So instead, Purba decides to visit his uncle, who lives on this side of the river. But to get there, he has to cross one of the last few patches of mountain forest. Illegal smuggling of timber to India is endemic, and as a result, Nepal's forests are declining rapidly. Even so, the remaining forest has its own brand of dangers, even for a Sherpa. It's full of leeches, waiting for a blood donor. In no time at all, Purba's legs are covered with leeches. So, with a fern frond, he tries to stop the bleeding, then quickly moves on. Finally, on the third day, Purba reaches his uncle's house. Time to say goodbye to Uberats, who will wait by the river until the waters recede. Uberats must carry his heavy basket alone now. Up in the mountains, it's the only way to transport goods. Even the sick have to be carried. In the tiny kitchen, Purba's cousin is preparing lunch. While she bakes chapati, a flatbread, Purba recounts his experiences up the mountains. Unable to get home to his family, he has little choice but to leave his things, especially the money he has earned as a guide, with his uncle until his wife can come and get them. His cousin prepares the traditional dish of dal bhat, rice served with lentil soup and a vegetable curry. It's the staple diet of the Nepalese, and in its many variations, eaten twice a day. <laughs> As part of their final preparations and acclimatization for the ascent of Everest, the expedition first climbs Island Peak, so named in 1951 by the British mountaineer Eric Shipton. Although the peak is at 6,000 meters, it's a relatively easy climb and a popular destination for trekkers as well as an acclimatization exercise for more serious climbers. The ascent of Island Peak is basically just a hike up to high camp, followed by a more difficult climb from there to the peak. It's little more than a walk in the park for a Sherpa like Nima Tenji. Everest presents a much tougher challenge. But as with all Sherpas, his client's safety is paramount, regardless of any risk to himself. <laughs> I've been working in the expedition business for eight years now. Since 2004, I have climbed Mount Everest six times from the Tibetan side and twice from the south. On Shisha Pangma, I was twice. In our work, it's important to not just get our clients to the top, but also safely back down. I hope we can do that again this time.
All attempts on the southern route up Everest start in Kathmandu and from there fly to Lukla. The airport is arguably the world's most dangerous. At the north end of the runway are mountains and at the other end a 600 meter drop into the valleys below. The pilot gets only one chance. Going around again is not an option. It is a busy airport. Not just tourists, but everything that's needed in the mountains is flown in. During the peak seasons in spring and autumn, more than 30 planes a day use the runway. Construction of the airport was initiated by none other than Sir Edmund Hillary. But inevitably, it was the Sherpas who built it, by hand. Just south of Lukla is Nima Tenji's home. But with few roads, it's a two-day journey on foot. Lukla is the gateway to Everest. Porters crowd the streets, eager for the custom of its endless stream of tourists. Here, modern tourism comes face to face with the harsh realities of life as a Sherpa. In the absence of roads and trucks, building materials are procured by hand. But as a well-established mountain guide, Nima Tenji is wealthy enough to avoid such back-breaking work. Few Sherpas are so lucky. They make their living by supplying stones for road and house building. Nima Tenji continues his journey homeward. No roads, steep valley floors. Life is hard here. Young calves or yaks cannot be left outside to graze as they do in more gentle terrain. And it's usually the women who fetch fresh forage for the young animals. In Solokumbu, as in Purba's home in Makalu, every square foot of soil is used to grow food. Here it is potatoes and cabbage, practically the only crops that survive at this altitude. Around noon, clouds build on the flanks of the Himalayas. Even near the end of the monsoon season, it rains almost every day. Although the Sherpas now have modern thermal clothing, still their most important piece of equipment is the humble umbrella. In July, the average rainfall is 280 centimeters, twice as much as Britain's wettest ever June on record. Whether climbing mountains or at home in their villages, the Sherpa people have learned to live with extreme weather. Late afternoon, and Nima Tanji finally arrives home. It's still pouring with rain. To greet their father, his two children have stayed home from school. It's the first time they've seen him for months. <laughs> Despite his relative wealth as a guide, nevertheless, Nima is still building this small home with his own bare hands. Once inside, the children wait impatiently to see what Daddy has brought them. Like children the world over, they love sweets. But today they have a gift of much greater value. Next day, the new red umbrellas are carried to school. It's a long journey, especially for one so young. The children have to walk downhill for two hours. But the way home takes half an hour longer making their daily commute 
a four and a half hour round trip. Nima Tenji's little farm lies at 2,900 meters. The only crops that grow well in the small garden behind his house are potatoes and cabbage. During the few months Nima Tenji spends at home, he helps his wife Futi. The rest of the time she looks after the family in the fields on her own. With no shops a westerner would recognize, the family has to store their year's supply of potatoes. Nima can only hope they will last through the winter. But life is not always unremittingly hard work. While Futi looks after the children and prepares dinner, Nima Tenji takes the opportunity to visit nearby Pangom Monastery. But today is not a day of meditation and prayer, but one of celebration, a curious blend of ancient tradition and modern Western culture. First, the Sherpani perform their traditional dance. Then it's time to get right up to date. A mobile phone serves as a jukebox. First, the children perform a dance. Then everyone joins in. It is a rare break from Nima Tenji's otherwise harsh life, alternating between farming his small holding and guiding climbers up the mountains. The expedition has reached North Base Camp in Tibet. This is the first stage of the northern route up Mount Everest and the one taken by Irvine and Mallory. Vehicle access is possible here, unlike South Base Camp. Supplies are brought in by truck, then transferred to yaks for the onward journey up the mountain. The third Sherpa, Nima, supervises the loading of the yaks for the next leg of the climb. It will take them to the base of the North Col at 6,400 meters. <laughs> Tact and savvy are needed in these negotiations. Every time they weigh the loads, the Tibetan aides come up with different results. Finally, all the pieces have been weighed and all differences cleared up. Now the yaks can be loaded for the ascent to the ABC, the advanced base camp. As always, the Sherpas will look after their clients well during the ascent. A complete kitchen, including gas bottles and food for a month, is loaded, and the yak caravan sets off. Past the Seracs, impressive ice formations, they climb from 5,300 to 6,400 meters. Once there, the Sherpas will set up a camp where the expedition members will stay for around a month, depending on weather conditions. They will set up the tents, cook, and wash up for their clients. It's not just on the mountain that Sherpas provide critical support. To survive in such extreme conditions, months of preparation are needed. So between expeditions, Nima and a colleague carry out equipment maintenance. Cooking gear and ropes are checked. The most critical equipment is the oxygen masks. If one of them should fail, in the worst case, it could result in the death of a client. A Sherpa's reputation is crucial. 
When tourists climb Mount Everest, we accompany them. They come as clients, but they soon turn into friends we care for. We make sure the path is safe. We look after the tents, the food, and most importantly, the oxygen bottles. When clients don't make it to the peak, we bring them back safely. They often come again, in the hope of a successful second try. Word gets around. When more clients come, we have a secure income. Nima's home is Kathmandu. Its famous tunnel district, just a handful of streets covering about a square kilometer in a sprawling city of over 50 square kilometers, is a magnet for tourists. Over two and a half thousand businesses are crammed into this area. And it's not just trekking gear that attracts the visitors. The shops sell everything a tourist could wish for. From souvenirs to carpets, pashminas to woolen goods, and not least, Tanka. These intricate religious paintings depict Buddhist deities and are used both as teaching aids and as the center of rituals which, through meditation, can bring a devotee further down the path to enlightenment. Nothing better illustrates the deeply spiritual nature of the Nepalese people in an otherwise chaotic and commercialized city. When the summer morning sun casts a golden glow over the city, it is the temples that are the first to come to life. The Swayambhunat, or monkey temple, is a paragon of peaceful coexistence of the major religions in Kathmandu. Both Buddhists and Hindus come here to honor their gods. Nima's return home is timely. His wife, Dolma, is pregnant, and the new baby is due any day now. So he prepares breakfast for their little son. It's an easy task compared to cooking halfway up a mountain. Traditional tsampa is served, fried barley flour with salted butter tea. <laughs> After breakfast, it's time for Nima's son to go to school. Unlike Nima Tenji's children, he doesn't have to walk for four and a half hours but in many ways, his journey is just as dangerous. The roads in Kathmandu are full of hazards. In the morning and evening rush hours, the city's crossroads are a nightmare. Getting around Kathmandu is no easy task either. Apart from riding a motorbike, the fastest way to get around the city is the tempo. These three-wheeled vehicles are found across Asia. Their exhausts choke entire cities. With scant regard for their own or passerby's safety, in a garage on the edge of a street, Young workers melt metal scraps in a makeshift furnace to produce fittings for a temple.
hygiene doesn't feature too strongly either. Next door, salted wild boar meat is for sale. There is no limit to the pollution and noise. Nima is making one of his rare visits to the Tunnel district. It is here that he will find the greatest choice of pashminas, traditional Kashmir shawls. After his long months away, he is looking for a gift for his wife. Mission accomplished, in the afternoon he leaves the hectic city behind him and withdraws to the Pulahari Monastery. Away from the hustle and bustle of the city, he seeks Buddha's blessing for the imminent birth of his child. He lights butter lamps and incense sticks, but he knows Buddha's blessing is not so easily attained. It is only through good deeds, compassion and self-sacrifice that his wish may be granted. It is a principle all Sherpas bring to the task of guiding on the mountains. The expedition is preparing to leave advance base camp. To reach Camp 4, they must climb the glacier to the foot of the North Col, which is over 7,000 meters high. Before they set out, a Lama recites prayers for protection, wishing good to all men and averting harm to the expedition members. Gelu was the last to join the team. He is a highly valued member because he also took part in the 2010 search expedition for Irvine's body. Figures made of ghee, butter lard, are placed among the rocks that bear an image of Buddha. Then the Sherpas hang prayer flags in all four wind directions. A handful of Sampa completes the ceremony. This is a final supplication for protection. When the tourist season is over, not all Sherpas return to their homes. Some seek employment opportunities abroad to better support their families. Gelu is one of some 100 Sherpas who spend the summer in Austria. For six years, he has worked in the Alps near Salzburg, in the kitchens of the Schmidt Zabirov Lodge, three or four times a week. But perhaps it's not too far from his roots. The lodge lies at 2,000 meters in the middle of a 10,000 kilometer walk that extends all the way across Europe. Sherpas like to work in the mountains, no doubt. For many, that's their only choice. And once a Sherpa has worked in the trekking business, he never wants to work inside a building again. Most Sherpas work as mountain guides until they are 55. Then they switch to office work, which gives them more time for their families. The point is to be happy with whatever you are doing. Gelu may be happiest outdoors and up in the mountains, 
but working in the lodges' kitchens has its benefits. Drink it and have us. Yeah, I'm on Yeah, I'm here. I'm done. Apart from the income it brings during Everest's off-season for guiding, the skills Galo has learnt stand him in good stead when it is time to return home. In the tourist lodges at the foot of the Himalayas, these new skills can be used to further supplement his income. After years of practice, Galu has become a good cook. And he has perfected his German. <laughs> But it is up in the high mountains that Gelu really feels happiest. The team that will search for the body of Andrew Irvine is snowed in at the advanced base camp at 6,400 meters. Although the sun is out now, there has been fresh snowfall every day preventing an ascent to the search area. The climbers try to pass the time by planning the next stage of the expedition. Their thoughts center around the question of which route Irvine might have chosen. Der Hintergrund unserer Suchstrategie nach Andrew Irvines Leiche Our search strategy is based on the fact that Irvine's body has been seen once with certainty but possibly three times bereits aber auch dreimal gesichtet wurde The most credible report in my opinion is that of a Chinese climber Chu Ching who in 1960 saw a body near the ridge which can only have been Irvine's since at that time, Mallory and Irvine were the only ones missing in that area. Trying to put themselves in Irvine's shoes, the climbers hoped to work out the route he was taking back down the mountain before he disappeared. I can well imagine that, in a state of exhaustion, one could miss a correct turn and would then simply continue in the hope of finding a rock crevice. Some rock crevice to spend the night, or just to survive. My vorschlag is... I suggest we climb up the normal route to the ridge, like we did last year. Then follow the ridge downward and search close to the ridge line. It's not just the snow that is holding back the team. The summit of Everest is the dividing line between China and Nepal. Ascending via the southern route requires a permit from only the Nepalese. But Mallory and Irvine had taken the northern route. This route passes through Chinese territory, and a permit is required from their authorities. For three weeks, the expedition is condemned to wait until the Chinese authorities have prepared the route. At long last, the wait ends, the weather clears, and the Sherpas can start for the North Col at 7,100 meters. Once there, they will set up camp with everything they need for the search. They have a steep climb ahead of them. But in spite of the altitude, the Sherpas move incredibly fast. Each of them carries 25 kilos. 
Regardless of the thin air and an ascent of 700 meters, they only take two hours. On arrival on the North Col, there's no time to rest. At this height, the weather can change instantly. The Sherpas have to prepare the campsite without delay. Around 7,000 meters, the camp is in a zone where it can be hit by jet streams. Although the sun is still shining, the first gusts of wind are making their work difficult. By nightfall, the wind has calmed down, a welcome surprise. In the advanced base camp, everyone is busy. While the Sherpas plan the next day's search, the first climbers, ant-like, are already on their way to the summit. The new morning brings bright weather, but Charlie Garbel, the Austrian meteorologist, has warned the climbers of strong winds over the next few days. But the Sherpas are not put off. Along the ascent route to the two highest camps, traffic is heavy. Other climbers have taken advantage of the fine weather and are already on the way back down. Through his telescope, Jochen Hemleib watches the ascent of the search team to Camp 6 at 8,300 meters. The greatest challenge is the environment. Sleeping in a tent at 38, 40 degrees centigrade below zero. In Camp 6, even the melting of snow is a problem. To get one liter of water, it takes one to one and a half hours. Putting on a pair of expedition shoes can take more than an hour. And then you still have to strap on the crampons. For most people, this is difficult to imagine. Theo is trying to contact Gelu. But it soon becomes clear that the Sherpas have started a day too late. Piercing gusts and the biting cold force them back into their tents. Communication is all but impossible. Again, the wind drives in the fog covering the mountain. But the Sherpas refuse to give up hope. Again and again they discuss the search route. So it's very strong windy. With the wind is a little bit less and we try to go off at five. Just in time, the wind does calm down. The Sherpas set out for the search area at 8,500 meters. It's already their second day in the death zone. With only limited time left, they search the rocky, icy slopes step by step. It is möglich, dass sie hier alle vier zusammen den Grat absuchen würden. Bitte antworten. Following Teo's advice, the four of them focus on the ridge. Yeah. 
It's steep here. Oxygen masks and snow goggles limit visibility. The four search for several hours. Then the storm starts up again and forces them back. The search this year was better, more precise than last year. We were like a family, and the teamwork was really special. We have not found Irvine, but we have gained experience. One thing is clear, Irvine is not in this area. The Sherpas have done their best. But with so many rock crevices and snow drifts to conceal a body, Mount Everest could hold its secret forever. The expedition over, the four Sherpas fade quietly into the background. After six months, Perber can finally see his little